Hey everybody, I'm Dave Hodgkins and welcome back. I apologize for the long time since the last video. Due to the current global crisis, I've stayed really busy at my normal job, which has impacted me making videos, but now I'm back. So in previous episodes, we had done some experimenting with making meat. We had also thought about taking the channel in a different direction, but after some feedback from several people, we're gonna keep going with the meat videos. Today, we're going to recap our experiments from last year and look into the subject of the title, what you need to make mead. But first, I need your help to appease the YouTube algorithm gods, and all I need you to do is smash that like button, and if you haven't already done so, go ahead and click that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps me out a lot. Appreciate it. Now, if you're watching this on a TV, just click the up arrow on your remote, click the ellipse button with the three dots, and you'll find the like and subscribe buttons there. Now to recap. In our first mead video that we made, it was making mead with Costco honey, and that was a traditional mead that we made, and it came out well. I did not take a reading, uh, a gravity reading, to begin with, so I don't know what the actual alcohol content was of it, the ABV, uh, but it ended up tasting great. Next, we did a Viking's blood mead. Now, this was an experimental batch. It did come out decent, but I should have used more cherries with it. I tried a second batch using a tart cherry juice, but it came out a little bit too tart for me. Then we went on to make the Dragon's Breath mead. Nope. <laughs> I even let it age for a year and came back to it, and it's still a no for me. Maybe next time, instead of using jalapenos, we'll use uh, some Red Hot Candies for a little kick. I love jalapenos, just not in mead. Now, the orange pineapple mead, this came out pretty good, and I'd recommend it. I later made a straight pineapple mead using 100% pure pineapple juice, and that was great. And then we did the Meduselt mead, and this has become our, one of our favorite meads, and has been made into a five-gallon batch since then. This was the apple pear mead, and it was a hit. We've had several other experimental batches going on. I've got some going on right now. I've got an orange pineapple banana uh, mead going on. I've got um, a, and actually this is the raspberry lemonade mead. And as you can see, this came out really nice. It's nice and clear. Uh, by the way, thanks to my friend Steve for the wonderful uh, mead glasses. I appreciate it. Um, and came out, and it tastes really good. But I digress. Now we're going to look at today's topic. What you need to make me. This is a beginner video. Somebody who is looking to start making me. This was at a request of uh, some of my other uh, subscribers. And they just want to know what's the equipment that's needed to be able to start brewing mead in their own home. So that's what this video is for. I would first start by recommending supporting your local brewery store if you have one. Here in Kalamazoo, we have the home of Oberon Ale and a ton of other great beers. That's right, Bell's Brewery. And if you live in this area, go see them as they are awesome people there and they will help you out. They helped me out when I was first starting. Uh, to make it, they walked me through all the equipment that I was going to need and helped me pick everything up. Now, if you don't have a local business that you can support, I will have links in the description below and the YouTube descriptions below, and you can get that from Amazon. There will also be QR codes for each item on the screen. If that's easier for you, you can just scan the QR code from there. So, let's get started. So, we're going to look at first what are the What's the equipment that you're going to need that you're not going to have to keep replacing unless you want to brew more at a single time. So first are brewing pails. So here's my five gallon uh, pail, uh, the ale pail that I use. Uh, when you get these, you want to get one that has uh, the lid. Not all buckets come with the lid, so make sure you get one with the lids and with the grommet, the rubber grommet right in the side here, that's what you're going to put your airlock through. 
Now, as you've seen, when I'm making the smaller batches, I'm using a two and a half gallon pail. So you want to use the two and a half gallon pail. If you're just starting off, you're not sure exactly what you want to do, use a, get a two and a half gallon pail, use that. Uh, you won't be having as much invested uh, when you start making it. Next are carboys. So carboys are, we do our primary fermentation in the buckets. It's much easier to do it in the buckets when you're doing primary fermentation. But then when we go to secondary fermentation, we, uh, when we take it off of the leaves and move it into secondary fermentation, we need carboys. So I put it into, here's my five gallon carboy that I use. This is a plastic one. You can get them in um, glass as well. Uh, the glass ones are heavier. I prefer the plastic. It just makes it easier for me to move them around, especially, obviously, once they are filled with liquid, it makes it a lot easier to move around. When we're working with the one-gallon batches, using the two-and-a-half-gallon pails, then we use a uh, one-gallon glass carboy uh, that we have here. So if you're going to be making one-gallon batches, you're going to want one-gallon. And you can actually even get these in half-gallons as well. You're going to want a cleaning brush. So once you get done cleaning this out, you're going to want one of these cleaning brushes. The cleaning brushes will help to get everything out from inside of there. Airlocks are important. So our airlocks, we're going to put inside the grommets there. And that allows the gases to escape out, but no microbes to get in because we fill this up with star sand or vodka. Um, something that's along that lines, so that it will stop any bugs or anything from getting into our uh, fermenting brew. Now that's this is one style that we use, uh, and I use these ones here primarily on the buckets and on the one gallon jugs. The other one that I use quite often is a this is a three part airlock. Uh, this one here I will use with my five gallon jug there. Now you're also going to need stoppers. So the airlock goes into the stoppers and the stoppers go into the jugs. Okay? So you're going to need stoppers. So these stoppers here, these smaller ones, are great for the one gallon jugs. When I'm dealing with my five gallon bucket. I'm using a number seven stopper. It looks a little bit different, um, but I will use, let's plug that in there, put this into my five gallon jug and it will allow air to get out, but we fill water up or we fill uh, star sand up in here or a little bit of some vodka and it stops anything else from getting inside. So you're gonna need stoppers as well. A siphon. Now, because of the fact I'm using both, uh, this is my six and a half gallon bucket. We move into um, the uh, five gallon carboy, or when I'm do, using doing a one gallon batch, using my smaller bucket into my glass carboy, my one gallon glass carboy. On that, I'm using a siphon here. Now this is an auto siphon that I use. And when I'm using this, I know it looks like something out of Austin Powers, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, use, I have a larger one for uh, my larger buckets and my larger carboy. And all you gotta do is you start it up and it will start auto siphoning it from there. I also have a smaller auto siphon that I use. Uh, now this one here also has attached to it. The smaller auto siphon is used when I'm using these smaller uh, batches when I'm creating those. Now you'll also want with that, so when we get to the point of going from uh, secondary to primary, uh, we're just going to siphon right into the other bottle. When we're going from uh, secondary into bottling, I'm sorry, when we're going into primary to secondary, uh, we don't need the wand on it, but when we're going from 
uh, secondary to primary, we're going to use a spring-loaded wand filler. Now, what this allows it to do, I don't know if you can see this, is it's got a little spring-loaded catch in there. And when you depress that, it will allow the liquid to come out. So when you put it into the bottle and you press down, the liquid will flow. When you lift it up, it stops flowing, but it leaves it filled up. And you can go from one bottle to the next. You definitely want one of these. It makes life so much easier. You will need a hydrometer. If you don't have a hydrometer, you will not know when your mead is done. You need a hydrometer. So this comes with the tube. And I like this tube here because it breaks apart for easy cleaning. I can fill that up. And we use our hydrometer here to figure out what our original gravity reading is and then what our final gravity reading is and every gravity reading in between. This will let us know what our alcohol content is and it will also let us know when our mead is done brewing. You don't want to just wing it and toss it into bottles. That's how you end up with bottle bombs and those are bad. We don't want bottle bombs. Uh, check out my other video on how to calculate the ABV of your mead. Uh, I'll leave a link to that in the description below as well. Uh, you'll want to be able to know how to use that so you'll know when, uh, what your alcohol content is and what your final gravity reading is when it's done. Bottles. So I like colored bottles. i uh, got the green bottles, got the blue bottles, especially when I have multiple uh, meads going on. Uh, I will know which one is which when I fill them up and when I go to drink them. So you will need bottles. Now, if you're just starting off and you just want to reuse some wine bottles uh, that you buy from the store, go for it. If you start getting into it, you're going to want to go out and pick up uh, a box, a, a dozen bottles, a case of bottles, uh, just to be able to use them. Uh, they're not that expensive. And then you're going to need a corker. Now, there's a handheld corker, and I've got a uh, picture of that right here. The handheld corker is fine for recorking a single bottle. That's what I started off with was a handheld corker. After doing a dozen bottles, I realized I don't like the handheld corker. <laughs> so I eventually went out and I went over to Bell's and I picked up a table corker. I almost took that out. So the table corker is great. You set the bottle here, it rests on the table. You just put your bottle in here, you put your cork in here, you bring this down here, and it will compress the cork and put it into the bottle for you. And you can do a whole lot of bottles in a few minutes. So it's a wonderful device to use. So those are the components that once you buy them, you're not going to need to keep rebuying them. But now let's look at our consumables that we're going to need. So the first consumable that we're going to need here is star sand. This is key to keeping everything clean. Uh, this is the acid sanitizer for surface sanitation. Uh, the great thing about this is it's no rinse. So I can wash everything down with it. I can rinse my bottles with it. Now you're going to add it into water. Uh, you use one ounce per five gallons. So when I'm even just making up a small batch and I just do uh, uh, like two and a half, three gallons of water and I'll mix in about 20 ounces, or I'm sorry, 20 milliliters, not 20 ounces, that'd be a lot, uh, 20 milliliters of star sand into it. I make up a full five gallon batch and I'd use one full ounce of this. Uh, but what the great part is, is that it's no rinse, so once I finish sanitizing with it, I can go ahead and start working with, uh, uh, with my mead and my other equipment. Yeast. You're going to need yeast. So I like the uh, yeast that you see here. Uh, these are the Lavlin brands. 
Uh, these are the ones that I use. Red Star also has good yeast. Uh, we'll talk about the different types of yeast in another video uh, coming up. But obviously, you're going to need yeast and you will be going through it uh, as you're making your meat. You're going to need honey. Now, if you can find locally sourced honey, that's the best way to go. Uh, whenever I can get local honey, I will use that. But when I can't get local honey, I actually just go over to Costco. Uh, this five pound one is $10. Um, so it comes out to uh, two bucks a pound. I can pick these up. Uh, this is just straight up pure honey. And that's what I will use. And it comes out good. I really enjoy the meat that I get from that honey. So absolutely, you can use that honey. Next is you're going to need water. You don't want to use tap water. You will want filtered water. Um, go out and buy spring water, okay, if you're going to use water. Now, in other videos, as you see, uh, I'm using apple juice or I'm using mango nectar um, or I'm using some other ingredients instead of water. That's fine. But in your basic mead, your traditional mead, use good water. Next thing that we're going to be looking at is Dimonium phosphate. Now, dimonium phosphate is a yeast nutrient. I used to use raisins. Um, and, you know, my, my meat came out well. And if that's what you're going to use, that's up to you. Absolutely. I'm not going to knock anybody for using raisins. If you want to use raisins, use raisins. Uh, but then I started using uh, dimonium phosphate. I got a little bit better results. So I'm going to keep using that as my yeast nutrients. Uh, you don't need a lot of it. Is uh, We're talking... One and a half to three quarter grams per gallon. So for a five gallon batch, you're going to use one and a half to three quarters tablespoon. I'm sorry, teaspoons for five gallons. And we can talk about step feeding later. Then once it's done, you're going to need potassium sorbate. This is your stabilizer. This will allow you to back sweeten your tea. Again, that'll be in future videos that we'll be making. Um, but it also make sure that uh, it stops the fermentation. So uh, I use a two-method uh, process where I'll use this here, and then I'll also cold crash it. I want to make sure that the bottles don't explode because if it starts fermenting again once it's in the bottles, you could have what are called bottle bombs. And again, that is bad. We don't want bottle bombs. And then finally, we need corks. So I like to, personally, I like to use the synthetic corks. Um, I buy them in the 100 packs. Uh, you may want to buy them in the 30 pack. There'll be links to both of those below, uh, both the 100 pack and the, the 100 count and the 30 count. Um, you can pick out whichever one that you like, whichever one's going to work the best for you. So that's the basics that you need to start brewing meat at home. Um, need some basic equipment, and then you'll be able to rock and roll. So I hope everybody enjoyed this episode. Uh, in our next episode, we're going to be making a favorite of ours apple pie mead. You will want to check that one out. I've got a great recipe for it um, and I'll be making a five gallon batch with it. It's awesome. Uh, but to make that video even more interesting, I'm going to open up the next episode with the sentence in the YouTube comments below that has the most likes. The only caveat is, is it has to be kept PG-13. I've got kids around. So uh, drop a comment in the YouTube comments below. Give me a one-line sentence. And if yours ends up with the most likes in it, I will open up my next video with that uh, statement. So I hope you'll join us. And that's right. Help me out and smash that like button. And don't forget to subscribe. Click the bell icon. You'll get notified when I upload a new video. Thanks for hanging with Hodge. I appreciate it. Cheers. We'll see you next time.